The scientists at NIST did not model the collapse of the towers. Their analysis was gravely flawed in many ways, but the biggest flaw was that the scope of their investigation was artificially limited. They took their analysis only to the point of initiation of collapse, as though all that followed was inevitable and needed no explanation. By limiting their investigation to the natural precursors of collapse, plane damage and the fire, they ruled out from the start any possibility of discovering evidence of planned demolition. We are here tracking the motion of the roofline at two tenths second intervals through approximately 32 meters or eight stories. This graph shows the height of the roofline as a function of time. The analysis is simpler if we plot velocity as a function of time. On this kind of a graph, a straight line indicates constant acceleration. First note that there is a sudden onset of collapse, as the point we are tracking makes a sudden transition from being at rest to an approximately constant downward acceleration. The slope of the graph indicates that the acceleration is 6.31 meters per second squared downward, which is 64% of free fall. As long as the top section of the building is in uniform downward acceleration, it cannot possibly be providing sufficient force to destroy the building. You might think a falling block coming down on the lower section of the building would exert a greater force than a stationary block. But that is true only if the falling block actually impacts the lower block, which would cause the falling block to decelerate. The only way the falling block can continue to accelerate smoothly, as we see here, is for the lower section of the building to give way without significant resistance. The top section of the building, whatever its condition, cannot possibly be destroying the lower section of the building. The destruction of the building must be caused by something else. There's a tremendous amount of falling debris, but under the canopy of debris, do you see the rapid sequence of explosive ejections of material? Some of the jets have been clocked at over 100 miles per hour. I will call them explosions because it's hard to find other words that describe what we are seeing here. The explosions are not isolated and few. They are continuous and widespread. They move progressively down the faces of the building, keeping pace with the falling debris. Notice that the explosions are occurring on multiple floors at once, over a wide zone, not in a floor-by-floor -floor sequence that might be explained by pancaking collapse. Notice there are explosions far below the point of collapse. Some are isolated and focused. These are often referred to as squibs and are commonly seen in controlled demolitions. However, this is not a standard controlled demolition. The building is being progressively destroyed from the top down by waves of explosions, creating a huge debris field. The destruction is in waves, not just in one wave. Most obvious is a rapid sequence of explosions near the visible corner of the building. But simultaneously we can see another wave of explosions much further down the face of the building under the canopy of falling debris. Notice that the concrete is being forcefully ejected outward from the sides of the building, already pulverized to dust. Notice that embedded in the dust clouds are huge girders and entire sections of steel framing that are being hurled out of the building. The horizontal speed of some of the girders has been clocked at over 70 miles per hour. What could hurl heavy girders with such force and give them such speed? Some people have suggested that the weight of the tower crushing down on the girders caused them to flex and they sprung sideways by a spring action. But we are not seeing isolated jumping girders. We are seeing a major fraction of the mass of the building, steel, concrete, office furniture, and the remains of human beings, reduced to small pieces of rubble and fine dust and being explosively ejected in all directions. Bone fragments are found on the roofs of adjacent buildings. The bones were not crushed in the falling mass, or they would have been trapped in the debris pile. They were pulverized along with everything else and blown out in all directions. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, molten steel running down the channel rails. Molten metal was seen coming out of the northeast corner near the 80th floor. The red-yellow metal poured from the tower along with a shower of sparks. It looked like steel in a foundry and there were many eyewitnesses that described molten steel. Later, we learned of very small spheres of iron found all through the dust. That iron must have been molten 
allowing surface tension to pull it into those spheres. NASA took photos indicating very high temperatures days after the event, and Firewise professors were perplexed by melting of steel beams. Independent scientists began to piece that evidence together, and they suggested some type of thermitic material must have been used as part of the tower's demolition. Then, an independent peer-reviewed report was published which found explosive red-gray chips all through the dust and positively identified as nanothermite or superthermite. Unlike conventional thermite, this stuff is a very high-tech explosive and confirmed what the independent scientists had been saying all along. It's more likely that any pre-weakening thermitic material were hidden inside the perimeter box columns. I had a replica of a segment of the WTC box columns made up. And like the Trade Center iron workers, I bolted the segments together. And made two sets of my two bolt blasters, placing them in the access hole. Let's listen to another eyewitness. Like, it sounded like gunfire. You know, bang, 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 bang. And then, and then all of a sudden, three big explosions. Is it even possible that thermite could do this? I guess it is. I made a four-sided box cutter split in two pieces so they could be inserted inside the column. I held it up on the burnt-out bolt blasters and thought I could hold it down with magnets. Let's see what happens. I think my box cutter blew about 30 feet up, consuming valuable energy and trimming my tree in the process. Nevertheless, the inside of the column was cut about three-quarters of the way through. Were thermitic devices or maybe explosive nanothermite sprayed inside those box columns? I'm not sure. And I'm not sure why this handhold is so large. Or why the side of this box column looks like it's blown outward. Or why three columns have a more intense glow, followed by six columns that don't, followed by another three that do. But I have an idea. But I do know that it's impossible for jet fuel or an office fire to melt steel or iron, which means the official story is wrong. Yet despite all the overwhelming evidence of explosions in molten steel, some people will still believe that this is aluminum and believe Building 7 fell naturally from an office fire. Isn't it time we use physical science rather than political science to investigate 9-11?